guys doing all right? Yeah. Wow, thank you so much for coming out of the show. I really appreciate it. As you know, I am indeed a ventriloquist. Now, being a ventriloquist, I don't do this on my own. So if you wouldn't mind, could you please give a huge round of applause to welcome to the stage my first character for this evening. His name is Ernie. Well, you know, I had a, a pet mouse called Elvis. All right, but my, uh, my pet mouse, Elvis, died today. Oh, Ernie, that's so sad, yeah. How did he die? Well, Kieran, he was... Caught in a trap. No, no, stop, 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 stop. Stop, stop hit you. No, I'm not doing cheap jokes like that on my show. I'm stamping on that straight away. No, don't stamp on it. That's how the other one died. <laughs> I'm sorry. For once in my life, I have someone who leaves me. Someone I needed so long For one sign of trade I can go where life leads me Somehow I know I'll be strong Right, Maurice. <laughs> Maurice, we have three lovely ladies here. Hello, ladies! Hello! Have you got some questions for them, Maurice? I believe that's how this works. It does, all right. Ladies! If you could choose one thing you'd like a man to smell like, what would it be and why? First of all, lovely lady number one. Maurice, I think steak. Steak? Steak. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> then any reason why steak? Oh, yes, because I like my men meaty. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> I have a favourite! <laughs> Super counterfactualistic, as the only docious. Even though the sound of it is something quite atrocious. If you say it loud enough, you'll always sound precocious. Super counterfactualistic, as the only docious. What word? Super counterfactualistic, as the only Hello, welcome to Landon Live. My name is Landon Harvey, and today we have ventriloquist Kieran Powell. Kieran, I'm so good. I was enjoying watching that because I've not been that clean shaven probably since the day that I filmed my DVD. Um, as you can tell, this is slightly <laughs> this is lockdown, Kieran, that hasn't been on a stage in what four months now. How long has it been? I've lost track of time. I don't know what's going on. I, we all have but yeah you clearly have yeah. been looking after your face and not letting the atrocious yeah. thing that's happened here happen to you <laughs> i gotta i gotta keep up appearances when, I, when i'm doing all these lives how'd you become a ventriloquist uh by having no friends i uh, no, yeah. i <laughs> that came afterwards it's normally how that oh. works no. I, <laughs> no, I saw a video of, uh, of course, you know, Jeff Dunham um, uh -huh. on YouTube. I saw Ahmed the Dead Terrorist on YouTube. It's one of these things. I'm used to explaining this story to people that have never heard of any of these people. Then I'm like, oh, yeah, a lot of people yeah. will obviously know everything I'm about to talk about. So I saw Ahmed um, when it went mm -hmm. viral back in, what, 2011 or something, whatever that was. Um, no, earlier than that. Anyway, whatever, whenever that went viral, I saw that. Um, I was 11, there you go, it was 13 years ago. Um, and I was like, cool, that's what I want to do. Which obviously is not the most appropriate video for an 11 year old to watch because it's a bit rude, but um, it's fine. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I was just like, cool, that's what I want to do. I wanted to be a magician when I was five. Um, so that was my thing for a little while. Um, but somebody didn't quite feel right about magic. I think, um, I think I worked out, I did some like psychoanalysis on myself and I think I worked out that uh, as a magician, uh, the trick gets the reaction, not the person. Whereas as a ventriloquist, you get all the reaction. Everyone knows it's you doing it. You're the star. It's not that you've paid $150,000 for an illusion. You are the talented <laughs> one. Ignoring how much the puppets cost. No one cares about that. You right. get the reaction. So I think, I don't know. I, I Just something clicked. It felt like the right thing to do. So I just taught myself way back when. Wow. That, yeah. That's really neat. And that's a great... 
that's a great way to differentiate that. Did you ever, so you never, did you ever do magic shows for your community or anything I like mean, that? I mean, like, I did them at school and mm -hmm. I, when I say at school, like, this is like preschool. I was, yeah. I don't know what it is in the US, but I was like seven or something or eight. Okay. Um, and there was some like school talent competition. Um, and I actually, right, I, I wasn't going to get to this, but I'm going to, I think I have the photo that I'm about to talk about in my favorite. So it's really easy to get to. Uh, okay. I've lied. No, I don't, but I have another one which is sort of relevant. Uh, well, this kind of shows it. This is how old I was. Um, I went through a stage whilst being a magician uh, when I decided I should be called Mr. Magic Man and I was going to be a magic clown. And uh, that, that if I can just get my camera to do it. Oh, there we go. Where, oh, where is it? There it is. Yeah, that was... Um, oh, that wow. Was, that, that's an actual thing that, that I actually... Oh, there you go. There's a nice extreme close up while I'm refocusing. That's, uh, that's, that and I, I thought that was so cool. I was like, yeah, look at me, yeah. Mr. Magic and the Magic Clown. Um, yeah. And now you understand why afterwards I had no friends. But <laughs> yeah, I just, I, I never really performed. I wouldn't ever say I performed properly as a magician because I didn't. I just did little bits. Um, okay. But yeah, performed tons as a ventriloquist, obviously. Yeah. Wow. So, How has your style as a ventriloquist evolved? throughout the years oh now we're getting technical aren't we um i i don't know i think at first um i've never been somebody that's like joke a minute or joke a second or whatever i'm not that kind of act at all um i don't really do jokes i don't really do like double act. a lot of people do like double act routines i don't really do that either um I kind of just, it, it's conversational with the audience a lot. I do a lot, I was saying before, I, I do a lot with the audience. Um, I interact with them a lot, um, both on stage with them in the audience and with getting them on stage, not just with using a mask or whatever, uh, but with, with a lot of different things. Um, just because I kind of, I realized a long time ago that people are funny um, and a lot of people don't, put trust in audience members to actually be funny normally it's like right i'm going to remain in complete control of this situation but i am going to get you on stage whereas i'm like no i want to relinquish control there's a point in my show where i give a guy in the audience a puppet he creates the character um and there's a lot more to it i don't want to go into the full detail but he creates the character for this puppet and then i give him a script and i go sit in the audience and watch him perform his own ventriloquist act <laughs> And literally, he sure, he could read the script, but so many times they've not. No. And it's not even like I'm on stage and I can regain control. Like, I'm in the audience. So what then happened is I've become a heckler trying to, like, steal back my own show in a way. And, yeah, like, I, I give all responsibility over to this, this volunteer. Wow. Um, I do a lot, like, the, whole, the bit I won't explain, the build-up to it. Um, there's a lot where I kind of work out getting the exact right person on stage. Sometimes I've spoken to eight or nine people in the audience before I decide who to get on stage. Because obviously, I, even though they don't, I know what I'm going to need them to do 10 minutes later. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And then I end up going back on stage, giving him a wig. He dresses up as Dolly Parton in a dress and with big balloon um, things. And yeah. we do a duet of islands in the stream, obviously. what? How else would you end it? <laughs> Wow. What a, what a perfect ending. I love it. <laughs> oh, no. that's, I can't that's wait really, to see this act being performed all across that's, the world. That's, yeah. that's, really, <laughs> <laughs> that's really great. That's really neat, though, because by having calling someone up, having them become the, the ventriloquist act and you heckle them, you're kind even even the, the worst it could possibly go is still an opportunity for it to be funny. So oh, you really can't lose. Yeah. Oh, I mean, that's I, I want them to to try and take over and like the best one. If I get this is why I talk to people so much beforehand. Because if I get somebody who just kind of goes, "Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm here today with my friend insert name of puppet," which like it says on the script, "I'm here today with my friend insert name of puppet." Now, when they create the character, they've already told us what they want the puppet to be called. But nine right. times out, of that, they read the words. I'm here today with my friend is certain name of Puppet, which is obviously funny, right? We yeah, get it. Yeah. That's a joke. Of course it is. And then they normally go in certain name of <laughs> and then says the name. But sometimes they just go, I'm here today with my friend is certain name of Puppet. Why don't you say hello to everybody? And, and it's just like deadpan like, 
Oh, that's not what I want at all. I want somebody to come up and go, good evening. This isn't funny. Hi, Ron. Hi. Like, that's amazing to me. If you're going to come up and literally not do anything I want you to do, I love no. that. And it becomes this, like, battle. And then it's suddenly more than a ventriloquist act. It's like this mm. comedy battle between you and some random stranger. It's just, I love it. I absolutely yeah. love losing control. It's great. That's, that's great. I love that. How would you define, who would you define your target audience? I don't really have one. I've kind of had to have uh, one in cruise ship audiences generally this last few years. Um, when I started on cruise ships, I was adamant, I'm not going to be a cruise ship entertainer. I'm not going to do a cruise ship act. I still kind of don't do what you'd expect me to do on a cruise ship. Sure. Um, but I've kind of had to obviously tailor my act to that generation a bit more. Like I, The first cruise I ever did, the first song in the show was If I Were a Girl by Beyonce. If I Were a Boy, sorry, by Beyonce, but I rewrote the words to be If I Were a Girl. That's my dinosaur puppet singing about if he was a girl. Um, which, like, you know, when you're singing to a thousand people that are all 70 plus, mm -hmm. they're like, I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand. And then, like, there's One Direction songs, and then there's things that I was just kind of like, okay, maybe Sweet Caroline can just slot in there somewhere because that will just tick a box. <laughs> yeah, that'll, that'll, they'll get that one clearly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I can't stand the song, but I deliberately, I do actually do it in some shows on ships, but I deliberately put it in in a way where I'm ripping into the fact that everybody's enjoying it so much. Mm -hmm. So it's like everyone's going, bah, 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 good time. And I'm just literally on stage slating them all, going, You do realize what, like, how ridiculous this is, right? And everyone's going, Yeah, we love how ridiculous it is. Bah, bah, bah. Oh, it's so um, that's one of those songs. It's amazing. You play it, and in in, that, that's uh, you can use that as your uh, people your, go uh, warm up act. Yeah, it's crazy. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I've um, actually seen, I genuinely have seen an entertainer who, um, <laughs> it's a really clever thing to do to be fair who uh before his show has a pre-show video of him getting the audience to sing along to sweet caroline and then literally it's like good time never feel so good da, 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 da. please welcome to the stage everyone's like this is the best act he's done nothing <laughs> he's done nothing to deserve that entrance apart from make them all sing their favorite song and i was like i sat in the audience going I hate this, but at the same time, I'm really respecting this is a really clever idea. <laughs> yeah. That's hilarious. And then what you do is you uh, you you videotape the audience responding in that way, and then you cut out the music and use it in your reel. <laughs> yeah, you do. Yeah. What, what, that standing ovation when I walked on stage? Yeah, get that every show. Right? Get that every show. Thank you, Neil Diamond. <laughs> That's hilarious. Oh, my gosh. Well, what is your process with coming up for uh, coming up with the characters? And when you when you started how did you define, you know, what characters you wanted to use in your show and how has that evolved over um, the years? It's changed a lot over the years. Like when I started, I would just buy whatever puppet on eBay or something like just whatever I could. Um, <laughs> and then that kind of grew into obviously isn't a lot of people do like buying actual characters and everything. Um, but it wasn't like was ne I would never think of a character or a voice or anything until I had a puppet. Whereas okay. now, um, I have a full vision of what I want a character to be and exactly what they're going to be. And then I have it made for me. Obviously that you can't do that when you're starting out because getting things made is rather expensive. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you have to, you have to evolve into that. But now that I have, it's, it's a whole different creative process. Um, I know exactly what I'm getting next. I'm not revealing it, but it's, um, it's completely different to everything I've ever done. It, I absolutely could never do it on a cruise ship. It's not, it's not family appropriate. It's um, it's very different. Oh, um, right. So you're, no, you're no their audience. Yeah, yeah. Well, kind of. I'm trying to 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 break into a different world. I mean, obviously, with coronavirus and what's happening with the world right now, I'm probably never going back to a cruise ship. Let's be realistic here. Yeah. Um, but. Yeah, I'm I'm trying to change things up and and do something a bit different and appeal to a a different demographic. Basically, I've got a bit comfortable in although I've I've loved every second of it. I've got very comfortable performing to people who are 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years old. Whereas now I'm like, cool, I'm 24. Let's perform 
like I'm a 24 year old to other people that are young and can enjoy like that comedy club setting. But I do everything with production values. So I'm like, can I take a comedy club style act and put production value on it and see what happens with that? So that's kind of the plan for now. I that's think. neat. I like that idea. That's cool. Can you talk a little bit about working with uh, Peter Pullen? Yeah, well, um, well, I said to you before, I adore that man. He's like my adopted granddad. Um, he's also old enough to be married. He's 74 years old. Did you know that? He's 74. Wow, I did not. Yeah. Um, he's just a wonderful person. He made this puppet sat right here next to me who's dead right now. Um, he <laughs> I think I just broke every ventriloquist code there is right now. Whoopsie. Um, <laughs> he's no, he's awesome. Um, he's just the nicest man. He lives 15 minutes down the road, 10 minutes down the road. Like mm. I'm, so, I'm so lucky. I know you had Steve on a few days ago um, and he makes everything yeah. for Steve as well. Um, and it's also really good because when people like Steve or people like Gareth Oliver or any ventriloquist that he's made something for go and pick it up, I always say to them, give me a call, because if I'm in the country and if I'm free, I'll pop over all and we all go out for lunch. It's great because oh, cool. it's just there, right? Yeah. Um, it's also really nice when he's building stuff for me that I can go to his workshop and like see it part way through, or instead of him sending photos of how about this color for fabric, how about this, 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 and like yeah, look, I can physically part. just go there and have a look because it's a 30 minute round trip, including being there. Realistically, yeah. it's never 30 minutes because I always end up sitting in there for two hours and chatting to him because he's just the nicest man and we talk for hours on end. But mm -hmm. yeah, no, it's it's he's awesome, he's really, really nice. Really, like we also both. Uh, both the two of us and my girlfriend and his partner all love Pizza Express. So we love going to Pizza Express together. I'm not sponsored by Pizza Express, everybody. But Pizza Express, if you're watching, I would love that. Get in touch. <laughs> well, what I love about, about Peter's work is that it's all, everything he's he builds is unique and he doesn't have uh, a defined style. Everything is very, like, you can tell it's, the hours that have been put into it and it's very, yeah. everything's patterned to its the specific puppet that yeah, it, it's so in it. cool. And also, like, I, that's the other nuts thing. Like, he, the amount of times he's called me and said, are you home? I was like, yeah. Just just come over for a minute. Um, mm -hmm. And, like, I don't... Actually, I can tell you one of these things. There was one extra figure in the shop that I can't tell you about because a lot of these belong to a private collection, which um, Pete restores all of these puppets for this person's oh. private collection. And one of them, nobody knows this person has, so I can't tell you that. But I did. you, you probably know Peter built Orville, um, among many other things. Orville the yeah. Duck was probably the most famous British ventriloquist figure ever. Mm -hmm. um, but so I went into a shop one day when he was restoring to Sooty, another very famous English puppet. Um, the Diddy Men, again, very famous. This is all very British, but like, yeah. if you speak to anyone in the UK and say, name some puppets, literally this is the list they will give you. So we he was restoring some Sooty, some Diddy Men, uh, three different Orvilles, and was making wow. two new ones for this private collector as well, because he'd made them in the past. He was making an emu and something else. Um, and he... He made those characters originally for the ventriloquists and all Emu wasn't a ventriloquist guy, it was Rod Hull, but he made them originally, but they've since been destroyed and don't exist. So he's making a sort of replica for this collection. Um, and like I said, there's one other that is the most famous ventriloquist character in British history. Like it's just that. And he had the original incarnation, the first one ever made in his shop. All just sat there in this workshop 10 minutes down the road. And I was just like, Huh? This is insane. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's really cool. And like, I went in the other day, and he was building this uh, six foot, like actually six foot in real life, um, Russian female bodybuilder who is ninety years old, and it, like it's giant, but it's it's nuts because it's got this solid big uh, like foam but solid body. Mm -hmm. with a uh like old traditional trigger head okay. um and then next to it like he's making me a second one of these like it's all this is not cast in any way it's all foam i'm like right. how can you do that at the same time afraid, yeah I, no, he's so wow. such a clever man such a clever man that must be a neat thing though from a builder perspective going from what kind oh, yeah. of tinkering with a hard figure to mm. a soft puppet and then also i'm sure that he's had uh builds where he's merged the two uh, oh yeah, all the time. Yeah, 
He's done some really cool. Oh, again, so many things that I've seen in there I'm not really allowed to talk about, but he did this really cool one um, for uh, a guy that does a load of online content where it's like a mechanism that no one has ever even attempted. Like it went from being a normal, nice looking face to at the pull of one trigger, the eyes flip around, the whole jaw detaches, teeth come out and everything goes red and it becomes a devil like that. Wow. Like it goes from being a normal looking figure. The mouth works, the eyes work, like individual blinkers, uh, like eyelashes, everything, like a full face. And then you pull one trigger and it just goes, <laughs> and like it, it's like unlike anything I've ever seen. And it was my, he was, he was refining some stuff. And he's like, look at this. And he's like, yeah. And, oh, yeah, it's really nice. And then he pulled this thing and I'm like, <laughs> it actually like is shocking and disturbing. Yeah. yeah. He's done some really, really cool stuff. I'm a, wow. I'm a massive fan of his. And also, he's amazing at animatronics, and I build loads of animatronic stuff myself. Um, mm -hmm. And so we, we nerd out about that and, like, which servos are best. And I managed to persuade him to move on to Futaba BLS 145s. <laughs> like, yeah, so he's, um, he's really, yeah, great guy. And I actually I do a lot of his... Um, I taught him, taught him and worked with him on a lot of the um, computer-controlled animatronic stuff that I do because he's never really got into that world. He's only ever done animatronics for live control. Oh, whereas okay. I, do it, I do it all computer control nowadays, so I showed him how I do all of that. And so, wow. Yeah, I don't know if you could tell, but I quite like him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, it, it's, it's been amazing. I'll have to, I'll have to interview him sometime. Um, so we, when you talk about animatronics, are you talking about you do that for your, your show and your characters, yeah. or is that a side thing? Okay. No, so I, I build stuff for myself. Um, mm -hmm. I've had a few requests to build things for other people. At the moment, it's genuinely just down to the fact that I don't actually have a workshop. We moved house at the end of last, end of last year, year before. Anyway, we moved house, and I no longer have a workshop. I'm building a workshop at the moment. Thank you for lockdown. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so I, once I have that up, I'm, I'm working on a couple of projects and doing some nice things. Wow, that's neat. How would you define your writing process for your show? We talked about this a little earlier, how you don't write this typical, like, setup punch joke. Yeah, but no. when we started, did it, uh, was it always, you know, you know, more audience involvement and more, um, you know, finding mm, that relationship always. between, okay. Yeah, I, I, uh, I can count on one hand the amount of actual jokes I've ever written. I'm, th I'm more proud of those jokes than anything ever. All right, mm. I'll put one of them out here right now, okay? So, it, like, the only style of joke I can write is, like, the ultimate bad dad joke. Mm. Anyone that's watching, if you want to put this in your act, you won't want to because it's so terrible. But please be my guest. I would love for this joke to take over the world. This is one of a few. Ready? I went to see a comedy show the other day. Saw this great female comedian do this hilarious routine about allergies. Go and Google her. Her name's Anaphylactic. Because <laughs> anaphylactic's a thing, it's a shock that you get when to do with allergies. And it also sounds Anna. It's even Ooh. better when you explain it. I love it. That's yeah. So that's, <laughs> that right there is why I don't do jokes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, I don't. I don't really have a writing process. I am. Um, I a lot of stuff I write on stage unintentionally, as a lot of people do. I film or audio record literally every show I ever do. Yeah. Uh, because I do so much audience interaction. When I, um, if some someone says something, mm -hmm. I I can be funny in the moment. I always say this. I'm not funny in everyday life. My girlfriend is much funnier than I am when we're in social situations or whatever. Um, but I. I can be funny on stage when I'm doing my job. That's when I am funny. Any okay. other time, I'm quite boring, really. Um, and so a lot of the time, someone will heckle me and I'll come up with something ridiculous back. I'll say something off the cuff in the moment. Doing my uh, show, as I've been doing from home, my live show every evening, um, I, I never write a script. I write a structure of what I'm doing and I just talk. And sometimes I come up with something really funny. Um, like, so, right, really stupid example. Um, not even that funny, but I, I did a lot of work on a ship called the Caribbean Princess, or as Americans would call it, the Caribbean Princess, right? Mm -hmm. So I walk out. <clears throat> I was on the ship every other week for three months. I walk out on stage. The first thing I said, no one's ever heard of me. No one's ever seen me. They've just gone to see whatever's on in the theater that night. Like, oh, some puppet boy, whatever, right? 
And I will count. Good, good evening, Caribbean princess. How are you doing? Sorry, I should say before I start, I will be calling you the Caribbean princess tonight, not the Caribbean princess, as you say. I'm English, so that's how we say it. Um, and because I'm English, we invented the language, so I'm right. Anyway, it's lovely to be here. And like, I said that off the cuff randomly the first time I was out there, and I was like, "Yeah, that's staying in." That, and then the whole summer, that was how I opened the show, and I enjoyed that even more <laughs> because I uh, I said it immediately. Eight hundred people are like, oh, he's, "He's this confident British lad who's telling us how we should talk." That was like a country accent from the uk though that wasn't american at all anyway no. and so in some way, was, was there like an uphill battle for me to try and win them back <laughs> and I really really? wow that's hilarious <laughs> yeah they're all fuming at me they're like why are you saying we say things how we want to say and i'm like i'm so sorry <laughs> just the entertainer um that's really that's really funny though i think it's interesting how you can um you know just with a pause with a puppet or have a puppet look at someone you can get a laugh and the way you yeah, have, yeah. the way you, you uh, convey something to an audience is just. There's so yeah. many different ways to make an audience laugh, and that's always why I like to yeah. hear how exactly. uh, how people approach that. Um, yeah, I just make it up on the spot. Now you've been doing cruise ships for a while. How did you get into that, and how long have you been doing those for? Um, I never wanted to. So, true fact, this is Talk not in my right. defense. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not even. I I didn't want to because. I can't swim, I'm scared of water, and I'm scared of boats. Mm. Genuinely true. Cruise ship, my worst nightmare. Um, and when I was 17, the people who are now my agent for ships got in touch and said, hey, we've seen you on YouTube. Um, we'd love to book you on some cruise ships. And I was like, not for me, I don't think, no. Um, and then that turned into, oh, wait, you're 17? Oh, we couldn't even if we wanted to. We can't actually book you till you're 18 because you're legally not allowed to work on there too well. So I then waited till I was 18. They were like, look, come on, I know you don't want to, but let us put you on a two-night mini cruise from Southampton back to Southampton. And then if you don't like it, you never have to go on it ever again. It's two nights of your life. I was like, all right, fine. And that was two weeks after I was having this conversation. So I had no time to think about it. It was just like, let's wow. go. Let's just do it, right? Um, and I did. And then I was like, rather nice isn't it like i had no idea i was saying to them when i was in the office i was like do i need to take a sound system and lighting rig and like my own set and they were like no 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 no, it's fine and I, but i had no idea i thought it's right. just gonna be 100 people in a rubber dinghy i had no idea no. that they're huge with the most spectacular theaters in the world like i had no clue um and yeah i went on and i was like oh yeah this is kind of cool and then it kind of just spiraled out of control and i was doing 45 a year for the last five years or so. I've been doing it for six, just, yeah, just over six years um, and about 45-ish for the last five years. So it's, it really quickly kind of turned into, oh, yeah, you're doing nothing but this for a while. Uh, but it's, it's great. I've been to 120 countries and I'm 24 years old. I can't complain. Life's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it, it seems like from from my point of view, and I've seen a lot of performers talk about, you know, dying as a performer on cruise ships, you know, when you do that in your later career. So if, if I, you know, if someone were to ever do cruise yeah. ships, like they would do it at the beginning, well, see what it's like. Yeah, and just, you know, I, I kind of used it, the way, I, the way I've always explained it is I, I used it to practice. Like instead yeah. of practicing to 50 people at some random... Everything, everything's being, controlled. Yeah. Yeah, right? Whereas... I was practicing in these 1,000, 1,500 seat theatres, doing two or three shows in a night and doing that two nights in a week consistently all the time. So I went very quickly from kind of doing quite big shows myself to being like, oh, yeah, you've got to hold 1,000 people and keep them entertained and engage for a full length of a show. And so I very quickly had to learn how to be a full entertainer, not just like have a five minute act. There's a very, very different thing mm -hmm. uh, between being able to do two or five minutes and being able to hold an audience for 45 or longer. Because like I say, my show was often very full of improvisation and getting people on stage. And quite often it wasn't 45 minutes. And if any cruise directors are watching from many ships I've been on that you didn't want me to do over 45 and I did, I'm really sorry. My show was regularly an hour, terribly sorry. But that's the thing, like you, you ha I learned very quickly, and it, like I say, it's something where you go, oh, right, you've got to be a true entertainer. And I, I learned how to be very big very quickly and kind of got acclimatized into doing that. And it was the best practice that I could have ever had because I, 
I learned from a young age and like the start of my professional career, how to perform in these massive venues and do my own show. So it's, yeah, it's taught me so much. It, it shaped me as an entertainer completely. Wow. Yeah. So you I got quite serious then, didn't it? <laughs> we're, getting deep. <laughs> we're getting deep. So you said you were 17 when you started cruise ships? I was 18 when I first 18, went on. Okay. My so was that, did you have yeah. the material and everything ready or did, were you just kind of thrown out there and you, I, you I on, on the paper room? had, so I did my first, I did a tour of the UK when I was 17 doing my solo theater show. Um, okay. It was a disaster. But that's not important. Um, it was a disaster in the sense that the agent that booked it was like, yeah, he's not famous at all, but I guarantee he can sell out 300 or 500 seat venues. Of course I couldn't. No one's heard of me. I'm 17 years old. Even on the poster, I look like a child. And so, yeah, it, I was performing in these 300 to 500 seat venues to like three to five people. It was horrible. Oh, wow. But equally, that taught me a lot of like, well, do you know what? These five people made as much effort to come and see this show and spent as much money individually as if there was 500 people here. So they still deserve the same level of show, even though it's going to be horrible for me. I still have to do the best thing I could. Uh, but that show was uh, 45 minutes each half. So on paper, yes, I had two full 45 minute cruise shows that could be done on a cruise ship. Like I said earlier, they very quickly changed into being more kind of the right kind of material. Um, and I kept writing and writing. Sure. And now I probably have about three hours or so that I would be comfortable to do at any given moment. Um, like that's having dropped all the stuff that isn't right anymore, isn't relevant or mm. isn't as good or whatever. Um, sure. Like you've got a lovely Disney cruise ship behind you. I do, mm. you do two different shows in Disney. You do a family show and you do an adults only show. There is not a single thing I do in those two shows on Disney that I do on any other cruise line. It's totally separate. And so I do a 45, 50 minute family show and a 30, 35 minute adult show. And they are totally separate to the two 45 minute shows I do on ship on other ships. And then I do on paper have a third 45 minute show for other ships, but I don't ever announce that because as soon as one act says, yeah, I've got three shows, every entertainer has to have three shows. And so it doesn't work. It's a part of the pun. You've all got to be in the same boat. <laughs> right. <laughs> Made a pun. <laughs> well, with, uh, with the 45-minute uh, family show and the 30-minute adult show, how did you find uh, – is there a difference in the maturity level of that for your audience? And how did you it's, find the writing? I mean, do you write differently when you think about writing for adults, or is it kind of the same Honestly, deal? the hardest thing I've ever had to do is writing those two shows, as far as, like, doing my show goes. Mm. Um, because it's so, so different to anything. Like, I, oh, hang on, my Mac's being funny. There we go. It's um, like the family show is not for kids. It's not a kid's show, not at all. Right. You cannot ignore the adults. You have people from two years old to 100 years old in there, and every single person in that room needs to be entertained completely equally, which is really hard to do yeah. because – if you're 45 and you've spent your, the last 20 years behind a desk building your way up in a company, as most people in Disney, a Disney Cruise Line have, because it's quite expensive to cruise on there, so it attracts a certain type of person. Right. Um, they're, they're not going to laugh at the same thing that their three-year-old is. So every single thing you do has to work on multiple levels or just be outright funny or just... It's so hard. So I a lot of the show, my family show, I play on the magical side of it a lot. Um, I do quite a bit with animatronics in it, which is obviously magical for the kids uh, in the fact that a puppet's coming alive and you're not touching it. And the way I always do animatronics, I don't like to leave the stage. I don't like this whole put the puppet down and walk off in anger kind of thing. I right. always, because everyone, especially on oh, Disney, they, yeah. right? Everyone's done it. And on Disney, they've all been to Disney World and been on like Avatar's River, Navi River thing and right. seen a lot more complicated, a lot more expensive <laughs> animatronics than I'm shipping around on my suitcase. Right. So like everyone knows that. So I ignore that and try and make it a storytelling point and, and make it kind of magical in that way. The kids still get excited when the puppet springs alive, obviously, because it's a real puppet all of a sudden. Yeah. But I try and tell a story in a way that it makes the adults go, 
Oh, yeah. And I've had so many parents come up to me after shows or, or even on other cruise lines where they haven't got their kids telling me that that made them cry and it's like brought up emotion in them. And I'm like, I'm a comedy act and I'm making people cry by telling them a lovely story kind of thing. So that I play on a lot more um, on, on Disney is that kind of <clears throat> magical stuff. Um, and then in the adult show, totally, totally different. It's not what I thought it would be at all. So I kind of went on thinking I would do sort of what I do on my normal cruise ship shows. Mm. No. What you have in a Disney adult show is a room full of sometimes 20 people, sometimes 400 people. And it really, it often changes. It's not like once in a blue moon you get a rubbish house. It, it, there's so much going on and it depends completely on the length of the cruise on so many things. So sometimes you're performing for three weeks in a row to 20 people. Um, but it's 20 to 500 people who are predominantly 20 to 50 ish um, and all quite drunk. But you cannot be rude in any way. Oh, so wow. you've got to perform to drunk adults who have finally got rid of their kids for the first time that day. Maybe the first time in a few days. They finally because it's an adults only part of the ship. Kids are literally not allowed in after nine p.m. and this show is always at ten or ten thirty or something. Mm. And so they're like, "No kids, let's go crazy!" So already they want to get drunk and have a party and do some yeah. like, really fun stuff. And suddenly it's like, "Hi, I'm a puppet boy. I'm going to come and entertain you all." They don't want to see you already, and oh. then. You can't be rude. It's like, huh? So going back to the fact that I do a lot with audience members, I've worked out many ways where I can make audience members do the rude bits for me, even though I'm literally telling them what to do. Again, I don't want to give away every piece of material that I've ever come up with, but right, of course. Um, <clears throat> I do a thing. I won't explain too much, but I do a thing where basically it ends up uh, with two adults on stage saying pretty much every curse word that's ever been written. Mm. I don't say a word. I'm not being a ventriloquist and making them talk. They are actually saying it into a microphone. And I get away with it because it's not from me. And so it suddenly, like, the, the ticking wow. of the box of being rude is ticked, but not in a way that will ever get me in trouble or, indeed, can, anyone could complain about because it's one of them that's doing it. It's like the person that was sat next to them. If somebody would be offended by it, they're like, oh, it's Chuck, isn't it? Oh, it's fine. We'll get him a drink afterwards. Like, it's fine. <laughs> but if the act goes up on stage, it's, it's like, yeah. yeah, you're a... Yeah. Like, you can't do that. Of course you can't do that. So it's... Right. it's Yeah, it's finding that, yeah, like I said, that little loophole that, that works and the little tricks that you can get away with certain things. But, yeah, I mean, it, by no means is are either of my Disney shows how I want them to be. There's so many more things that I would change if ever I get mm. the chance to. And... But yeah, they're heading in the right direction. Do you feel that you have to address the audiences in a different way too? Because you're playing to a larger crowd when you do family um, versus more of the... Kind of, yeah, I, I play the show differently. I, I never really address people in a different way in the sense that I, oh, I, yeah. hate, I hate the phrase ladies and gentlemen with a passion. It's the worst phrase anyone's ever come up with because what it says to me, and I, if you say it and you're right, you carry on. But for me, it's like... Ladies and gentlemen, with me going, you're the audience, I'm the entertainer, leave me alone, I'm going to do my thing. Like, if you're in a casual conversation with friends, you don't go, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, or hello, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> you go, hey, you all right? Hello, how you doing, how's your day? Like that, you just talk normally. Right. So yeah. I go out and talk normally. I talk to an audience as if I'm talking to one person, because sometimes <laughs> there's one person. But equally, it makes it, if there's 1,500 people, it makes it, personal it makes it feel like i'm talking to you directly and so i don't i don't change it in that way um but i do give it a bit of a different energy like when i'm doing the family show you've got to be a little bit more smiley and like isn't life great whereas in the adult show being british i could be a bit more sarcastic right. um like i i say yeah i know the last thing you want to see is a puppet show right now but welcome my little friend boys and girls sorry no we're not with the kids anymore like you can have a bit more Fun, like make fun of yourself a bit more whereas if you're mm. doing a show as a family show the kids are like i don't what we don't get it so it's just yeah it's just about the material side of it really yeah, wow it's yeah, very complicated yeah it, there's a lot of moving parts there I, uh, <laughs> yeah crazy crazy um what do you think is the future for cruise ships knowing that you've performed on them for many years 
Oh, Ooh. considering I've worked for Holland America line for a long time, um, and they just announced yesterday, no, this morning, that they're selling four of their ships. Oh, wow. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. um, it's certainly going to be very interesting. I don't know or think, I don't think I will be going back to it. Um, mm. I'm very grateful for everything that I've done on cruise ships. Um, mm. But I, I think for me, I would rather, I, I said I would do ships for one year, get lots of great practice in, and then go and start my career and do all this cool thing on land. And then like six years later, oh yeah, I'm still here, aren't I? I'm still doing the same thing. Like I'm rewriting stuff all the time, but like I'm still doing fundamentally the same thing, mm. which is never what I wanted to do. And so I think this has kind of given me the kick to yeah, do the things that you want to do. So like doing my show in here every night, Although yeah. I kind of envisioned it would be in a TV studio and I'd be paid a hell of a lot of money to do it. It's still a different version. Again, it's me pr having a great practice and, and working out how I would be as a TV host kind of thing. And yeah, I just think it's, um, it's, a, it's time to do something a bit different for me. But I do, I do think cruising will recover. Um, mm -hmm. It will take a while. We're not talking like next, this coming January. We're talking like 2022. It will probably get back into full swing. Um, I think some ships you mean, start like the ships at like full capacity, like they used to be, type full swing. Um, I, I, on, I think it'll just be it'll be down to two things. It'll be down first of all in the direct future if they find a vaccine, uh, which mm -hmm. right in front of me a news article just popped up saying uh, a UK coronavirus vaccine is working. The Oxford vaccine that they are testing currently oh, is wow. working, and it may be rolled out by September. Like if that works, and There's the like no talent, right? Right. If that happens and we can eradicate the virus or make it no longer a threat to public safety. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, we can resume normal life. But yeah. the issue with that is like, are people going to freak out thinking that there'll be something else? Because there's always right. something else. There's always something else coming out. There was an article three weeks ago about the fact that 20 something people in central China had the Black Plague. Like. Yeah. yeah, that thing that we thought was eradicated in the 1600s. Yeah, 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 that's back. So, like, there's all of the, there's so many ifs and buts, but I kind of think that the world will relax a little bit and go, okay, we had a big one, and now we'll just go back to maybe getting the flu occasionally, and things will go back. Because the flu's, the flu's always been here. Yeah, um, I mean, there's yeah. also a lot of arguments to say that actually on a cruise ship, Every single thing is cleaned every single day, multiple times a day. There is a medical center on board the ship. So if somebody gets sick, then immediately everyone that's important knows. And if it's something that could threaten everybody else, suddenly everyone's going to know instantly because it is an actual, It's a, even though it's a closed environment where things can transmit more easily, it can be stopped more easily when it's picked up. Whereas if you go on a city break or something and you brush shoulders of four people that have the virus and you catch it, and you're never going to see those people again, you will catch it not knowing and then oh. pass it on to everyone else. Whereas when you go back to the ship at night and you go, <coughs> I've got, a <coughs> you go to the medical center, they test you, right, you've got the virus, suddenly quarantine everybody on the ship until they can test everybody. So if anything, actually, I think it is a safer way yeah. to, to go on vacation in the future. I think it will take a bit of persuading to get the world to understand that. But right. yeah, I think it will recover. I think it will come back. It's very warm in here. <laughs> gonna... well, on, a, on a happier note, what my biggest fan. One of your... that, was, that was actually <laughs> a joke. My biggest fan. It was an actual, actual joke. <laughs> Not my joke. Didn't write that. Obviously, that's been around forever. Yeah. Um... <laughs> I don't know if you can tell I'm going slightly oh, mad today. It's been a bit of a long day for me. I had to get my car to be serviced at eight o'clock this morning. Oh man, that is uh, that's fun. It's boring, um, isn't it? Kind of, yeah, yeah, it's very, very boring. And that you mean with car troubles. Um, could you share a favorite show memory and maybe a show a memory from a show that was went crazy or maybe not how you were planning it would go? These always make for fun stories if you have one. Oh, I have many. But like I said before, because mm -hmm. there's so much audience participation in the show, mm -hmm. anything can happen. Um, <laughs> and indeed it does. Um, I don't know if I'd say it's my favourite, but one that sticks out in my memory, I was on the Regal Princess, a cruise ship. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> oh, God. Um, I'll have to censor myself for some of these things, but I will, don't worry. 
sure. Um, there was this, uh, the, the thing where I get the guy on stage and get him to read something, right? Um, I was doing that routine, and this guy in the audience, I'm trying to decide it, no, that's probably not appropriate to say what he said. Anyway, when I asked him what he does for a living in the audience, he said something that was very funny. Obviously, it wasn't his real job, but it was very, very funny. Um, I yeah. can't repeat it because it's a little bit rude. I don't want to do that to your show, but it was really funny. And I was like, right, forget everyone else. You, sir, are hilarious. Obviously, he didn't say that. That's what's going on in here, right? Get him on stage. And right. he was being, so the puppet then interviews him for about 10 minutes. That's how the routine goes. And he was being hilarious, right? And then he gets out this puppet, he creates the character, everything is so funny. I'm like, oh my God, this is a storming show. I'm having the best time. Aren't I just invincible? Like, it's one of those moments you're going, mm -hmm, yeah. I'm so good at life. Yeah, yeah, aren't I amazing? And then I go, right, well, what we're going to do is we're going to give you a match of introduction. You're going to take center stage and perform your own ventriloquist routine. Are you up for this? And he goes, yes! And so the music starts, the lights start going crazy. And at that point, they always turn off my mic just so I can like hand him the script and just say into his ear gently, just read what's on the script into the microphone. No, nothing else matters. You're going to be hilarious. They're going to love you, right? Just a nice little mini pep talk over the music. No one hears it apart from him, right? Sure. And at that moment, he looks at the script and goes, I'm dyslexic. I can't read. <laughs> and let me go. But you know, you wouldn't think of that. This guy's, you can be the most confident, funny person yeah. ever. But like, so th that's why I ask so many people so many questions beforehand to work oh. out because I know I'm going to need them to read and do this and that, right? So yeah. if somebody says they're a pilot, you know that they're going to be relatively intelligent. And also because they're a pilot should have relatively good eyesight, right? <laughs> right. If somebody says they're a farmer, they can be the nicest person in the world but they might not be the greatest reader or the most confident person, right? So you it's totally subjective and it's often wrong, but it's its about picking out those subjective things so that you can work out whether they're going to be able to do it. This guy was being so funny the whole time. I didn't for one second think that he wouldn't be able to read what I give him, and he couldn't, right? He yeah. got really nervous, really awkward. I felt sick to my stomach. It was horrible. But thankfully, he'd been making fun of his friend in the audience the whole time. So I was like, right, I tell you what, why, don't, why don't you and whatever is like Stephen, let's call him Stephen. Why don't you and Stephen swap? And he was like, oh, yeah, yeah, mate, can you do that? And Stephen's going, <laughs> no, no, I'm not doing it. No. And he's like, Stephen, please do it. Bear in mind, he's got a puppet on his arm this whole time. He's like, Ste Stephen, please do it. No, I'm not going to do it. Come on, Stephen, please. Oh, I'm not doing it. And he walks down off the stage to his friend. House lights come up. He's going, Stephen, please do it. And Stephen's laughing. Going, <laughs> <laughs> laughing really hard. Stephen laughs so hard he falls off his chair. And the whole world is going, oh my God, this is hilarious. Everyone's laughing so hard. And then he starts going, Stephen, please, Stephen, Stephen, starts kicking his friend. Oh my God. He's laughing going, oh, he's fake kicking him. I'm stood there going, no, he's actually really kicking him and it's really hard. And so I'm now in this situation where I'm like, right, there's a thousand people in here that don't know that this one guy is getting hurt right now. But still, there's a guy getting hurt because of me. So yeah. how do I diffuse this situation whilst not making a thousand people feel really uncomfortable for laughing at the fact that this guy is getting kicked right now? So thankfully, yeah. this Stephen guy, he wasn't called Stephen, I can't remember. He kind of was laughing, laughing, going, oh, my, oh, mate, stop, stop it, stop it. And then they both got up and stormed out, which actually sounds really horrible, but I think that's the best way that that could have ended. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. Then so you, just, you just kind of outside. sat back and watched it happen. Yeah. It was yeah. outside of the venue, right? Then I got some random other guy up who was like, I'll do it. And I'm like, don't care right now. Anything got him up and it was fine. But like... Yeah, I will never forget watching this guy kick the living daylight out of his mate in the audience in front of a thousand people that were wetting themselves laughing. <laughs> That's that hilarious. Was, there's many others, but that, that, that one sticks out. That was fun. <laughs> That's, I'm That's just really neat. The and now. Oh, I, I, I trust the audience so much. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. 
here's me just yeah. like, yeah, I trust the audience. And now I'm like, yeah, yeah, he ended up kicking the living daylights out of his mate. <laughs> Did you ever get your puppet back that you gave to the guy? Oh, yeah, yeah, he threw it at me as he stormed out. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it's a cheap one, it's fine. Obviously, I'm not going to give a nice, expensive custom. Oh, actually, nowadays I do give a nice, expensive custom made puppet to them, but back then I didn't. It was right. some random, like you know, the little birds that you can get off the shelf, like on eBay or something. Mm. They're like $20 with a squeaker in the mouth. It's one of them with a the squeaker cut out. I'm pretty sure everyone did that at some point. Got yeah. one of the birds and cut the squeaker out of the mouth. Yeah, it was one of those, but now I have a nice custom one that I give them. I think, is it here actually? It might be on this shelf somewhere. I say this shelf, I'm, I have a case downstairs that I half unpacked. Oh, yeah, it's here. This is, I'll tell you what, let's give a little shout out to oh, Ian. Phenomenal. He, is a, uh, he is an awesome new builder in the UK. And he made this for me. It's, um, it's very, oh, oh, he's gone full screen with me. <laughs> full screen. Technology. Yeah, so Ian made me this, um, which is now the puppet that I give to an audience member. It's a nice oh, little. Cool. Yeah, it's a cool little one. Yeah, beautiful one. I love, I love the colors on that. Um, extended neck with the, oh, look at that. like separate. I don't know technical terms. I don't understand these things, but it's very cool. It's got a yeah, nice space and everything. Super it's neat. To totally soft. And so for me, everything has got to be able to pack as small as possible. This thing compresses right. completely flat. It's really lovely. So yeah, that's so nice. Yeah, that's the one I now give to audience members. Phenomenal, phenomenal. There you go. Well, what have you been up to lately? Uh, since the pandemic, this, this this world of purple backlight in here, mm. doing my keep laughing show, as I call it. Um, so, I started by doing it. Sorry, go on. Oh, tell us about yeah. Tell us about the show and, and what it entails. So what it entails is that your the mic that you have clipped on your shirt here and keeps pulling it and making it look like a V neck, which it's not, and that really annoys me. Um, <laughs> no, so it, it's really, it's not really ventriloquism at all. Um, it's just silliness. I started it at the start of lockdown. Um, a local theatre got in touch saying, who obviously had to close, saying we're turning the theatre into a production studio, a TV studio. Uh, would you be interested in doing a weekly show with us? And it's literally like three minutes away from my house. I was like, yeah, that'd be awesome. Um, and then the day that the day before we were going to go in for a final meeting before doing any pre-production stuff, um, the government said, do not leave your house unless it, unless it is completely essential. You can leave once a week for a shop and once a day for an hour at a time for exercise. And it was like, I can't really classify going to a theatre to do a silly show as essential. So it just, it felt wrong. Um, mm -hmm. And it also, I was kind of thinking... Anyone that's what anyone that could watch it would probably boycott it, thinking, Well, how come he gets to leave his house? So it all just didn't feel right. So I decided against it. But then I was like, do You know what? I still want to do it. So I own a ton of kit, as you might be able to tell. If I turn off the studio lights, I own some nice stuff. Um, and yeah. that's I have three like cameras screen again. Yeah, beautiful beautiful studio. Studio. Thank you. There we go. Look at yeah. So there we go. I mean, it's slightly messy at the moment. I did a game show this evening <laughs> where um, you end up throwing stuff all over the place. So it got a bit messy. Um, but yeah, I've got like nine expensive studio lights, uh, three camera, four cameras, including a wireless camera um, for if I want to do silly stuff. I do a segment where I go check on my dog uh, called Let's Go Check on the Dog with a silly theme tune. Um, and I go yeah. and check on the dog. <laughs> it's really silly. Uh, but it's yeah, I just thought people are not so much now that the world is starting to open back up, but like back three, four months ago, People couldn't yeah. leave the house, right? So I thought, well, right. people want something. And so I did it every single weekday, Monday to Friday. Um, mm -hmm. I would do a show every single day at 7 p.m. UK time just to kind of give people something that they could watch in the evenings and just, like, look forward to. And it ended up being a lot of people told me it's kind of the thing that they'd have dinner as a family and then they'd sit and watch my show together, which is, like, lovely, right? People are That's super neat, down yeah. And, yeah, choosing to, to spend their evening... And it because it's all online, obviously people on here are commenting, right? People mm. comment, people I would obviously talk about the comments and interact with people the whole way through the show, still do. And so it, it kind of felt like they're part of it, which is nice. I get people to send stuff in. I did a segment, I still occasionally do do a segment called Who's Got the Biggest Potatoes? Um, where quite literally we just try and find out out of the viewers who's got the biggest potatoes. So uh, people <laughs> will send me photos 
of them holding a big potato. <laughs> it's, not really, it's kind of self-explanatory, really, isn't it? Um, so yeah, like, be fun. I, I like it. Yeah, yeah, we do. Uh, what else do we do? I, like people send me cakes. Um, so there's a great theme tune of if you can bake something like a cat and it's really silly it's all on my youtube channel go and watch previous episodes i've done 70 something of them now uh but yeah, yeah i did it every friday for for three months um and now i do it every tuesday and thursday it was getting quite tiring doing it every single day and also it's 30 minutes of completely fresh new stuff every single day i didn't repeat anything i didn't do any like stock old material it was all brand new 30 minutes every day which is quite a lot of material to burn through. Because um, obviously, I'm, I, once I've done it once, I'm not going to do it again. Even live, I'm like, no, once it's done, it's done. That's it, right? Right. And so, yeah, it got a, it got a, it got a bit much. Um, and also, I started doing uh, a completely random other job, being a broadcast producer, ironically, considering what I've been doing for fun in the evenings um, mm. for, for a few months, which was like... a big deal thing when we had 10,000 people playing an online quiz every day and I was running the whole thing. Wow. So, uh, yeah, because I was also commuting to London every day for that. I would be leaving the house at eight o'clock in the morning, not getting back till 4 PM, then writing the show, cooking dinner, doing the show at 7 PM and then breathing and then going to sleep and doing it all again the next day. Yeah. I was just like, I think I need to, to slow down. So now I do first Tuesdays and Thursdays and every Thursday is a really fun game show that we do. Um, I get three contestants on and we do loads of silly stuff. Like people have to, I give them something to draw. They have 30 seconds to draw a big fancy countdown comes up on the screen. I give them a photo and they have 30 seconds to recreate it. Like all these, the silly, silly stuff. Um, and it's, it's just lighthearted fun. It's, oh. it's not, it's not about me. It's not pretentious in any way. It's just silliness. And occasionally I get a puppet out. It is occasional. It's not very often at all. Um, and I realize I'm getting increasingly worse at ventriloquism <laughs> because I just haven't really done it for months. And so I. But that's I, okay. That's okay, yeah. uh, Kieran, because you gro keep growing your beard out and eventually it won't matter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I keep trimming the, the mustache bit of it because it gets really itchy on my lips. But maybe yeah. I should just let that to here <laughs> and then. Just properly comb it before you go on stage yeah. on camera, and then you're golden, yeah. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. I have a really talented ventriloquist. Yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it, yeah, it's funny. I started these Land and Lives because uh, I wasn't sure if we were going to have the ventriloquist convention this year, and uh, sure. I always thought it would be cool to hear people's stories because uh, there's so many people that, you you know, people either don't get to meet them in person or they, you know, it's always, I love hearing yeah. people's stories and how they started into the art and where they're going with it. So it's super neat. Where can we find, where can people find your show? Uh, it is live on my Facebook and YouTube. Um, okay. If you just search this name right here, if you search this name, Kieran Powell, um, you'll find my Facebook, my public Facebook page, which has a photo of me, obviously um and a puppet on it uh it's really you'll realize it's me um and if you go to youtube.com slash kieran ventriloquist that's me as well and it's live on there every single uh tuesday and thursday at uh it'll be 1 p.m central time that was quick maths <laughs> self high five yes very good. Um, <laughs> but also, every previous episode is up there. You can watch your heart's content. There's 40-odd yeah. hours of it now. So you could spend nearly two entire days nonstop binging my face and awesome. see the beard grows and how I have had to cut my own hair four times. Yeah, we, we'll know what season and episode we're on based on where your beard is. <laughs> yeah. right. And then like halfway through, it randomly gets shorter. And it was like... Huh? I'm like the wrong like, order. <laughs> Did I miss so something? That, yeah. That's the start of season two. <laughs> <laughs> We're now oh, at the breakdown point. I don't know if you can tell. This is the, the breakdown happening right in front of you. <laughs> well, in wrapping up this interview here, what are your hopes for the future of ventriloquism and for future ventriloquists? Um, I hope none of them are good because I like my job. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, no, I what I think, right? I kind of I I don't know where it's gonna go. I don't really I obviously I don't want to say it's dying. I don't think it I think it kind of started to and then it's coming back. But equally it's like 
it could get stale quite quickly and I don't mm -hmm. think it should. So I think it's about all of us working out a different way of taking it in a direction which isn't the conventional guy or girl standing on stage with a puppet on a stand. Like, great, but mm, I think there's other ways that we can use the art form to do something much more Im impressive visually or... Like, like I said earlier about telling a story, I'm writing a show at the moment which isn't meant to be that funny. It's, it's, telling, it's a musical. It's telling a story. Um, and it, it's using ventriloquism the whole way through. But it, the ventriloquism side of it is kind of secondary. It's not the important bit. The storytelling side and the, the, the production around it is actually the impressive bit. It's like you go and see a musical and you don't really think about, oh, they've got an amazing voice because they're just singing. You know they're going to sing. You come to a musical knowing someone's going to sing, and that's just kind of secondary to it. What you enjoy is the story that they tell and, and how they present the show, and that's kind of where I see it, or at least where I'm hoping it's going to go. Wow. But hopefully none of you do exactly that, because that's what I'm going to do, okay? Thanks very much. Appreciate it. That's no, my that's, career. That's the future of my ventriloquism, okay? You guys can... <laughs> you guys can... Uh can stick to your uh, ventriloquial you, cliches. You oh, ventriloquial. Yeah, he's bringing out the big guns. Oh, that's great. No, I, well, I don't know. I think it, it could become something really cool. I just think we need to take it in a different, unique direction. Yeah. And be original to yourself and your yes. material and your characters. Be original. Except be if you want to steal my terrible anaphylactic joke. Be my well, be my guest. Actually, I think I saw Bob Rumba earlier make a joke uh, in response to that. Where did it go? Um, he said oh. it's a great joke for antihistamine. Yes. Well done, Bob Rumba. You're a much better joke writer than I am. <laughs> That's a perfect tagline joke for that. Look, we're we're already writing. We have already got what like uh, there you go. like it's a material on here for free. Not my style. So someone else have it. It's not for me. Yeah. You Next convention, on. we're going to see all these people using those <laughs> flu jokes. <laughs> Every single show. Hey, you hear about this girl, Anna Philactic? Yeah. <laughs> Her auntie's got auntie histamine. <laughs> hey, thanks for coming, everyone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, I'm going to do a story for oh you. God. Here's a bit of a musical. And <laughs> 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 there you go. That's what you can do, Kieran. You can just put it to music. Cool. Yeah, that, yeah. that is exactly what I <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> well, that's phenomenal, Kieran Powell. Thank you so much for spending the time and sharing your story and ventriloquism. Thank you for having me. It's been lovely. Awesome. Thank you guys for tuning in, and we'll see you next time on Landed Live. Thanks, everyone. Bye. <laughs>